live again a little later than normal, but here we go. Hi there. It is April 2nd, our last first Friday, and we are on a different platform, and this is Facebook Live, so um, we're learning. Behind me you see Bailey and Kelly, and they are going through a uh, leaf packet looking for macro invertebrates here at Walm Creek. And today we're going to talk about water habitat, riparian habitat, and these macro invertebrates, which are indicators of water quality health. So that's great news, and we're really excited to bring that to you. I wanted to just give a quick update about what we do as Marion Soil and Water Conservation District, which is educate about water, soil, and the natural resources. And we're also charged with protecting it. So we help folks, whether urban or agriculture, with grants and site visits. So if you have a creek or a waterway and along your, your land, you can give us a call. We have a riparian habitat specialist that can help with grants. We also have folks that can get you in contact with our administration to help fill out grant forms if you're interested in financial help to repair those riparian habitats. So today we're going to get into some really fun things. We're going to talk about little brown fishes. We're going to talk about water quality. We'll get to some cool macros. But we're going to do this not with me, but with an expert, uh, the step biologist for our region, Karen Hans. So I'm going to flip this around and you're going to get to see Karen and here we go. Thanks, Karen, for being here today. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I am the Salmon Trout Enhancement Program, or STEP biologist, here in this region. STEP is a program within uh, ODFW that brings volunteers together with agency staff to help us uh, take care of the uh, salmon and trout and enhance their populations and enhance fishing opportunities here in Oregon. And uh, my volunteers, Bailey and Kelly, are part of my STEP volunteer team that uh, uh, helps us do things like uh, population monitoring and habitat restoration, education and outreach. And STEP also has a uh, small restoration hatcheries along the coast. So I'm here to talk to you today about the little brown fishes of the Willamette Valley and that live, the, these little fishes live in the creeks all around us. And here in Walden Creek behind me, uh, there's been a restoration project uh, by the city of Salem to make the creek better for fish and wildlife. Uh, you may have noticed right behind us is, the, is some uh, housing apartments. There's a school here and we're kind of right at the edge of the city. Now, Walden Creek flows into Battle Creek, which goes to Mill Creek, which goes to the Willamette River. And there's about 25 native fishes that live in the waters of the Willamette Valley and about 25 or so non-natives. And native fishes like we have in this aquarium, and I'll, I'll talk more in detail about them in a minute, but there's red side shiner, there's dace, there's sculpin, there's northern pike minnow, there's uh, lamprey and large scale suckers. Those are some of our native fishes. Uh, our non-native fishes, fish that were brought here in the last 150 years or so, mostly for sport, but oftentimes by accident, um, also from like aquariums, uh, would be the bass, the bluegill, the catfish, and um, things like uh, oh, certain types of chubs, and uh, uh, there's a, one called a keely fish. So there's a lot of non-native fish as well. But I rarely find those non-native fish here because this restoration has taken place. And the more the creek functions like a natural creek would have in the Willamette Valley, the less the non-native fish like it. And so behind me, you'll see the creek is kind of straight, but just out of sight, it, it, the city developed some twists and turns, what we call a meander in the creek, and they put in uh, log uh, stumps and, and pieces of wood that provide what we call structure. 
and that uh, is very important for fish habitat in the creek because it uh, provides a place for the fish to hide in when the creek is flooding. It provides a place for the fish to hide when there's something trying to eat it, like a bird or a bigger fish. And it also will create a pool that will connect to groundwater and provide a, a place for the fish to live in the summertime when the rest of the creek is running very low. And so this creek also demonstrates some of the challenges of restoring a urban watershed because um, whenever I come here I always find a lot of garbage in the creek and the water quality comes from a lot of um, city upstream so the all the chemicals that come from our cars uh, oil and gas and antifreeze, uh, copper from our brakes, um, powder from the tires, um, and, and it collects on the streets. And then there's the uh, fertilizers and pesticides that people use on their lawns. And all that runs into the creek through the storm drains. And it creates uh, problems for the fish because fish are very, very sensitive to pollutions. Um, they have permeable skin, which means things pass through the skin very easily back and forth, so they absorb these chemicals. Um, their, their sense of smell is, is very, very um, uh, good <laughs> and uh, much, much better than us humans. And so uh, they need to be able to smell these tiny concentrations in the water, to, uh, especially to know when there's danger. And so when we put a lot of pollution in the water, it makes it hard for them to detect those odors that tell them where their food is, that tell them how to get around, uh, that tell them when there's danger. It's, it's kind of like uh, standing next to somebody wearing way too much perfume or way too much cologne. It like completely overwhelms all the other smells around you. So um, here in Walden Creek, uh, right now at this time of the year, the water's running well, it's cold. I, I have captured trout here in this section of the creek before. And so the water quality is pretty good, but come the summertime, when the water gets very low and it gets very warm, the amount of oxygen in the water drops. Um, the, it's, much, it's a much a harder place for the fish to live. And so the fish are going to swim away. They're going to go down into Battle Creek and into Mill Creek where there's more water, where the water may be colder. Um, but the macroinvertebrates that live here, they can't leave. So the stoneflies and the mayflies and the um, caddisflies, the snails, the scuds, the beetles, uh, all those worms and, and creatures that live here, they, they have to stay and they have to be able to survive in that environment. And so we use macroinvertebrates for what we call an index of biotic integrity. And we look at the types of aquatic insects and macroinvertebrates that are here. Some of them are very sensitive and they cannot survive in poor water quality. Some of them are and they can survive. So when we look at the diversity, uh, the species assemblage of macroinvertebrates, if all we see are sensitive, or, or excuse me, if all we see are, are tolerant species, the, the types of macroinvertebrates that can survive in very poor water quality, then we know that the water quality is not very good here in the summertime. But if we find stoneflies and mayflies and other types of aquatic insects that cannot tolerate low dissolved oxygen and pollution and uh, other water quality issues, then we know this is a good place year round. And so that's one reason that Kelly and Bailey are looking for these macroinvertebrates.
there can be a great deal difference of water quality within the streams in Salem. And much of it has to do with how much of that creek is in the city and how much of it is um, in, in a more urban area. I just have a quick question, Karen. I'm sure. noticing we talk about urban and I'm looking behind you and I feel we are in an urban setting, but I see a ton of native species behind you from the Douglas Spirea to Snowberry, uh, Highbush Cranberry. These are, these are all native plants here and this riparian buffer is at least 50 feet, wouldn't you say? At least, yes. And so I think that's one of the things I missed on the introduction about Wall Creek and the, you know, how it runs into Battle Creek is what, what this is and how that plays into macros and then the little brown fishes. Yes, and so when you have a diversity of native species, um, a lot of different types of shrubs and, and flowers and grasses and trees, uh, that brings in a diversity and a increased number of insects that that brings in more birds um, and, it, and it just makes a, a, a healthier um, more robust riparian area the, the trees will grow up and shade the water and help keep it cooler and the uh, terrestrial insects that live on the trees will fall into the water and uh, provide food for the fish. And so um, the, the pine tree, the pond, uh, Willamette Valley ponderosa pine, the, uh, the ash trees, the maple trees, these are all adapted to our climate. And uh, that's why they will thrive here. And the riparian area is that zone that's affected by the creek. So it's going to have what we call a microhabitat that is going to be cooler and have a higher humidity. And there are certain species that need that, certain species of trees, and then amphibians like frogs, red-legged frogs, and rough-skinned newts, and Pacific giant salamanders. They need moist skin, and so they're going to need that moist area. There's going to be other um, animals like deer and raccoons that will come through here uh, looking for shade, looking for water. Just downstream, there's a beaver that lives here. And the city of Salem has put in what's called a beaver deceiver into the beaver's dam. And what that allows is for the dam to stay there and, and provide that, that pond of water for the beaver, but not back the water up and cause flooding. And it's a pipe that goes through the dam that controls the water level. Because if you take the dam out, the beaver will just rebuild it. But if you put in what's called this beaver deceiver, then the beaver just keeps putting um, more materials on the dam and keep, keeps it there. And all the benefits that come from that uh, but it doesn't back up too much and cause flooding issues. And so the, the beavers are a, a very critical keystone species here in the Willamette Valley. And so it's just wonderful that the city of Salem is allowing that beaver to be here because that's what's providing a lot of the summertime habitat. Now, beavers don't build a dam unless they have to because the reason a beaver builds a dam is to protect it from predators so it can go into the water and get away from things that want to eat it. So the beaver here has built this dam to impound this water to protect it and its family, but it is also providing water for fish and water for amphibians and reptiles and muskrats and blue herons and ducks and all the other um, plants and animals that need that, that uh, habitat. So uh, if Bailey and Kelly would like to do a quick demonstration um, on how we caught these fish 
And while they're getting set up, I am going to catch some of these fish and I'm gonna put it in this viewer so you can see it a little bit easier. Sure. Completely blown away with two sanings, how many fish were caught. This try to move the camera just a little closer. This particular reach of Wall Creek is just really rich in native fishes. And so what we have here in this viewer are called sculpin. Now sculpin live on the bottom and they are what's called a lie in wait predator. And they have a skinny little tail and they have these big pectoral fins here and they lay under the rock and they wait for something to come by like a little stone fly or something and then they dart out and they grab that as as a meal and then they dart back under the rock and they lie in wait so they have a big mouth and big pectoral fins to push themselves out now Identifying sculpin is, there's about six species that live here, and it's notoriously difficult. And so I'm guessing that these are probably reticulate or prickly sculpins. They are the most common sculpin of here in the valley floor. Now, if you'll observe Kelly and Bailey and how they're going to take the seine net, and they're just sweeping across uh, the bottom of the creek and then they're just kind of uh, pulling up the seine net. What did you ladies get? Did you get some fish? Yep. Yes, we did. Can you just kind of walk up maybe carefully with them and uh, so the uh, folks can see how many fish are in there? All right, thank you, Kelly and Bailey. So that is one technique that we use as fish biologists to capture fish. Now this next fish I have in the viewer is a lamprey. It is specifically a western brook lamprey. Now the western brook lamprey lives its entire life here in the, in the creek. As a species, the lamprey in the fossil records have been traced back over 300 million years. They survived um, three mass extinctions. They survived the onset of the jawed fishes. And so they're really remarkable uh, fish. And this particular fish will start its life in the gravel 
<coughs> excuse me, hatch out and then it buries itself in the mud. And so sometimes people tend to think about as the perfect stream is like an all gravel substrate bottom in it. But um, these fish need mud to live in. So what you want is a variety of habitats. Now these fish will live in the mud and they, they do come out and, and move around a little bit. They filter feed. So they pick up little pieces of, of deatrice and, and debris and little tiny creatures, little tiny microscopic creatures, and they help keep water clean. So they're very important for water quality. Then the brook lamprey, when it's about five to seven years old, will transform into what this is. This is an adult brook lamprey. Now, I don't know if it's a male or female, but it's getting ready to spawn. And so it will pair up and both the male and female will work to build a nest in the gravel and they will then lay the eggs and then they will die. So they are what's called a semiplarious fish and the other uh, fish here that we Friday, $20 word. You have to say it again so we can go into the weekend feeling smart. Okay, semiplarious. And uh, so salmon are also semiplarious, which means they spawn one time and then they die. So this is the Western Brook lamprey. Now there's another species of lamprey that lives side by side with this um, fish, and it's called the Pacific lamprey. Now the Pacific lamprey will start its life just like the western brook except when it gets to be about five to seven years old and just about that size it will transform into an anadromous fish. There's another $20 word. Yes, that's, and so anadromous means that the fish starts its life in fresh water and then goes to the ocean and then returns to spawn in fresh water and salmon are also an anadromous fish. All right, so our Jeopardy has a uh, salmon in category. Yes, semiplarious and... So now we're gonna catch... Now, I one of the big reasons that I put these fish into the creek water from which they came is because fish are very, very sensitive about water. For example, we've done some experiments in hatcheries, and if you are at, uh, at the Oregon Hatchery Research Center, which, by the way, is, is on Highway 34 to Walport, and it's open, once COVID is over, it will be open to the public again. And I strongly encourage you to go there sometime. They have tours. It's the Oregon Hatchery Research Center on Fall Creek. It is wonderful. I've been there. It is worth the drive. I hope they open soon, Karen. Yes. And so what, what we found at these experiments is that if we give the fish a choice between creek water and well water, they will choose the creek water even if it's only 1% creek water over 100% well water. So that's why I have the fish in their native water because that's where they're going to feel the most comfortable. So what I have in here are three different native fishes. This here, this, this one on the bottom, that is a large scale sucker. And they can grow quite large They'll get about this big. And they live in the Willamette River. And then when it's time to spawn, they swim upstream to a small creek like this. And they broadcast spawn their eggs. So the male and the females release their eggs together and they're sticky and they sink and they stick onto fine gravel sandy substrates. So they don't build a nest like the salmon or the lamprey. 
However, they do migrate like salmon. Now, when we think about fish that need to swim upstream to spawn, the most common fish that people will think of is salmon. But there's many fish here in the Willamette Valley that do that same thing, that they live in the big river and then they swim upstream. Now, when I mentioned how Walled Creek to Battle Creek to Mill Creek to the Willamette, when I found these suckers here several years ago, I knew there was a connection that the fish could pass through. Now, we have a lot of problems here and everywhere, really, but here in the Willamette Valley that um, we've put in culverts and we've put in dams that block fish passage. And they don't allow the fish to migrate where they need to go to spawn. Um, and so when I found the suckers here, I knew it was clear sailing from here all the way to the Willamette because I know that's where the adults came from. The other fish in here, this, uh, this smaller fish right here, and, and I don't know if you'll be able to catch it on the camera, but when the sun hits it, it sparkles like it has glitter on it. And it's called a speckled dace. Now dace are very common here in the valley. They, um, they're, uh, and, and they're, uh, they swim around, they don't live on the bottom like the, uh, the sculpin do. They eat small insects and they, they, they get, they're, they're going to top out about as big as that sucker in size. So while the sucker will grow, go down to the Willamette River where it's a lot more water, a lot more food, they're going to get a lot bigger. Those dace are going to stay small. That's about as big as they're going to get. Is getting uh, behind the sucker. Oh, like, nope, I'm shy. Camera shy. <laughs> Camera shy. Now this other this other little fish here. Let me see if I can catch a bigger version of it. It's a, called a red side shiner. Red side shiner. And it's one of our most common uh, fishes here of the Willamette Valley. And they. So, yes. Yes. So I wonder if there is a thing called fish blindness. Would they see a fish and it's just a fish? Well, and um, so that's one reason that I, I call these the little brown fishes. Because when I've done bird surveys before and you just see this flock of little birds go by and, and, you, and, the, and they'll say, oh, just put little brown birds. Put down little brown birds. And so I got this notion because when I go out to the river, and as a fish biologist, I'm always looking down, and I would see these big schools of little brown fish swimming around, and I couldn't tell exactly what they were, so I just sort of uh, got the notion, well, I'll call them little brown fishes. <laughs> so this is an excellent example of a red side shiner because he is in his breeding colors here, and he's, this is where the, the name comes from. He's got his red-orange stripe down the side, and uh, these are, um, so they, they swim around in schools, they eat small insects and, and tiny little single cell creatures like Daphnia. Uh, they will eat, actually eat little larval fish if they, they get big enough and the, and the little tiny first hatched out fish are small enough. So they are what's called Pisivorous, another so Pisivorus means a fish-eating fish, oh, wow. yeah. and um, they're, they're quite tolerant of warm, low-dissolved oxygen, which is why they're so common here, and they've been able to thrive and persist in all the... So they've really adapted. Yes. Because most of our native fish like the real cold, and that means high-dissolved oxygen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, when, when, let, me, let me just clarify that. Okay. Um, some of our native fishes, for example, if you look at sculpin, I mentioned earlier there's six, five or six different species. Sculpin can also be used as an index of biotic indicator. 
as we do with the macroinvertebrates because some species of sculpin are much less tolerant, which is why I uh, guess these sculpin are reticulate or prickly because they are the most tolerant of low dissolved oxygen and warm water. So there's a sliding scale and I think that that's fair to explain. So in addition to these fishes that I have found here, uh, I would also expect to find a northern pike minnow. And I want to mention it because it is the most misunderstood fish in the Willamette Valley. Um, it has been vilified uh, as a, uh, and, and many people think it is not native. I would say that is my, the number one myth that I experience uh, when I talk about fish and people will say, oh, it's an invasive species. It is not. A northern pike minnow, they used to be called squawfish and they are a native piscivorous fish um, and so they're perfectly welcome in my book to be here because it's all part of the big picture of the circle of life of the balance between predators and prey. So uh, do we have some macroinvertebrates here for folks to see? So do you want to, can we, is there a way to bring them over here and show okay. folks? So quite frankly, in all honesty, uh, Jenny is better at macros than I am. Um, I, uh, I really should be better. I can tell a mayfly from a stonefly. <laughs> but uh, when people ask me about microinvertebrates, I usually say uh, they're fish food. So um, if there's a way that... Uh, I don't know if uh, Kelly or Bailey has be is better, or Jenny is better at this than I am. <laughs> so in the ice cube trays, the reason the ice cube trays are here is, uh, I was explained it. You don't put a lion with the monkeys in the zoo, okay? Some of these are super, some of these are predators, so you try to separate them, and you're identifying them. And it looks like Kelly and Bailey found worms. A lot of worms. There's an aquatic sow bug on here, and I want to get this out because on my finger. These are, like Karen talked about, indicators. This is in the um, tolerant group, so it can tolerate some pollution. There's another one, and then where did that what fresh is, water is this the? Go? Is this what you were talking about, the aquatic style bug? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you got a damselfly. Okay, oh, so a damselfly is going to be less tolerant of pollution. I believe, Jenny, it's a medium species. It is. It is right in the middle. So we have intolerant, uh, what, somewhat tolerant. And yes. So damselfly is, is, is a good sign. And this is a crawdad. Cool. Crawdad or crayfish, and this is a native. Now we do have some invasives here in the valley, but this is called a signal. Now he's got some pretty small claws here, which tells me that this crayfish has probably lost its claws and it's regrowing them. Um, and we never put crayfish with fish, they will eat them. So we've kept him separate in a bucket. These are also an indicator of water quality. They're in the medium range. You got it. And um, so they're, they, they do um, breathe dissolved oxygen from the water with gills. However, they also are tolerant of being on land. I guess you could say they can hold their breath. And so I'm not worried about holding them out of the water like this because they move around a lot. And uh, I'm going to put him right on back into the creek. Awesome. Uh, Bailey and Kelly also found a uh, freshwater shrimp. So really, I know that's really weird. On the tip of my finger, you can see this kind of translucent 
curled up uh, invertebrate, which is the freshwater shrimp. It's in the lower quality group for uh, the indicator species. So, uh, moving my finger, there it is. Cool. This crab was awesome. That's a pretty good, I mean, if we, if we were to look at things, they do the family biotic index, so you take the diversity of your sample and then the, the number, uh, you know, where they're at in the tolerant, intolerance, or medium quality group. So between the fish and the macros, we have a pretty good idea of Long Creek's diversity. Yes. And so um, the uh, section of this property outside of the riparian zone is open to the public. If you want to uh, come here for a walk and to see well, while we were just getting ready to set up, we saw an Anna's hummingbird was uh, hanging out in one of the trees. There's a lot of geese here. Uh, Jenny saw a bird called a snipe. And, um, and then it, when you walk down the stream a ways, you can see where the beaver dam is. But we do ask that you stay out of the riparian area, um, this zone along here, because the city has done a lot of work to plant the shrubs and, the, and there's grasses and flowers coming up. There's a, looks like a uh, native shrub right there. Is that a currant? That is a currant. Yes, that's a red currant. And so um, if you stay in the grassy area, um, outside the riparian zone, that would be great because they want to minimize the, the amount of uh, traffic in here to protect the plants. Um, and uh, yeah. Karen, I love this. I am um, working for a soil and water conservation district, knowing how important water quality is. I think having a little deeper dive into what's in the water and what it means is really important. In my my goal to talk to most people is if they were to walk away with two nuggets of knowledge, what is it that you hope they walk away with today to keep in their back pocket? I know this $20 words are pretty awesome, but two things that you want people to walk away with today after doing our little brown fishes in our riparian program. So fish need water and they need clean water, uh, just like we do. And this water will eventually go into the Willamette River and a number of cities downstream from here take their drinking water from this creek. And so it's really important for us and for fish to keep the water clean. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, many storm drains connect directly to the um, creek and, and one day I was walking in a neighborhood and I saw a sheen of oil running down a, a stream and as I walked back to my house here was a guy he was power washing his engine and he was washing all the oil and grit and dirt and it was going down his driveway and into the storm drain and right into the creek and that as I mentioned earlier that contains a lot of chemicals no, there was a, a situation in Seattle, Puget Sound, where coho, adult coho salmon were swimming into a creek and literally dying within hours. And the National Marine Fisheries Service and the University of Washington and USGS fish researchers, they all got together. They spent over 10 years doing this very intense study and they narrowed it down to one chemical from tires that was in the and in tiny concentration parts per billion that was killing those salmon and so everything that we do on the land ends up in the water where the fish are and that's the water we drink so anything you can do to reduce the number of chemicals that you use in your life on your lawn um, and, and uh, it's, it's interesting because when people ask me what they can do, and I always tell them drive less. And I'm always thinking in terms of all the pollution that comes from vehicles. It never occurred to me that the tires were going to contain a chemical that killed salmon. Uh, copper that comes off your brakes. Copper is death to fish when it gets in the water. Now, if you think about it, you're like, well, it's just my car. But then if you multiply that times 50,000 cars, it really does start to add up. 
And so another thing you can do is you can support efforts to reduce that urban storm runoff. Rain gardens, uh, bioswales, detention ponds. Uh, if you can put one of those in your neighborhood, at a, help build one at a business or at a church, anything to reduce the amount of storm water runoff. Because those same researchers that identified that chemical in tires, they took that very water that was killing the salmon, they put it through a rain uh, garden, and the fish were fine. Filtration, they really do work. And so be supportive and of those types of projects and help out. If you, if you encourage, you, you, if you go to a church, encourage them to put in a rain garden in their parking lot. And, and there's money out there, there's grant money funds that can help them with the expense of doing that. So that would be my strongest message today is that yes fish need water and I know that sounds really obvious but if you think about all the details that go into that fish need water 12 months a year 24 hours a day seven days a week and they need clean water but so do we so everything you do to help the fish you do for us too us humans too so good. are there any questions so we had at one point we had seven people watching and no questions have come in but if you do have questions this is a great time and if you can put them in on the comments down here on the bottom we'd love to take some questions and I'll wait for a few minutes and just keep building off what Karen said is that native plants uh, the shade over the water all that filtration that shade helps with keeping the water cold clean and clear and Mary and SWCD is so excited to work with urban and agricultural landowners to help put native plants in the ground, to help build up those riparian habitats, and keep that water clean for us and fish. So if you have questions or wonder what it is we can do, please call or email, and we'll put you in contact with the right people. Um, we just really, really love this area. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I feel very lucky to be able to have water as clear as it is, but we still have a lot of work to do to maintain uh, water quality and the integrity of our habitats. So I don't see any questions coming in. Just a few more minutes and I just want to make sure folks know um, Karen has some really wonderful volunteers and as we gear up to open up slowly maybe do some outdoor school one or two this spring and then jump into fall hopefully salmon watch. If your heart is calling like oh, how do I get involved I really enjoy what you guys are doing and what I saw today, you can get a hold of Karen through ODFW's website. She's the step biologist for the Mid Willamette region. And if you're interested in doing education, you can reach out to me, Jen Ammon, on our Marion SWCD website as well. Um, fingers crossed we keep moving forward and we can get out and about and do more of this. So, Kelly and Bailey, thank you so much today. I'm going to turn this around and uh, you guys give a wave if you will. Thank you. Thank you. Go Beavs. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for tuning in. We did not get any questions, but feel free to reach out via email and we can do some follow-up with you. And, and if you ever, if, if you're watching this uh, on the web page, on the recording, please feel free to reach out to me or Jenny with any questions that you may have uh, or if you would like to help out in any way. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Thanks thank you all. so much for joining us this morning.